Shekha. So we shall now go on to our keynote address. We have our most eminent uh, Professor Michael Brodsky, an individual of global recognition, consultant of Department of Ophthalmology and Neurology from Mayo Clinic, a world authority on pediatric neuroophthalmology. He would be talking on congenital anomalies of the optic disc, approach to diagnosis and management. On to you. Uh, sorry to have uh, inadvertently kept you as the last speaker, but we all are there looking forward to hear you. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. It, what a wonderful conference. I've always sort of lived. I, I remember, you know, Bill Hoyt, I used to visit him, and he said as he was getting older, you know, and, and sort of moving moving out of neuro-ophthalmology, in other words, and getting toward retirement, he sort of pictured himself as he got older going down into this vortex that was the optic disc. And and so it's kind of what this conference reminds me of. It's this, we're all within this vortex that's sort of pulling us in and, and we, we share that those common features. Um, my talk might might run over by about five minutes um, because I wanted to throw in some some neat juicy stuff. But um, it's an honor to be asked to cap off this session with a whirlwind tour of the um, congenital optic disc anomalies. What I love about this topic is that um, so many of the optic disc malformations that we diagnose in clinical practice are predictive of specific anatomical neurological and systemic abnormalities. The slides and, are not moving. Oh, no, that's okay. I haven't moved them yet, but thank you. Um, hopefully they'll move. <laughs> we'll, know, we'll know soon enough. And it's just amazing how, how often this tiny um, area of optic disc tissue can, use to, uh, can be used to predict medical treatment. Um, so let's look at a few of the major congenital optic disc anomalies. No, they're not moving. I don't know why. Oh, there we go. Okay. Well, first of all, um, let's start off with optic nerve hypoplasia, the most co common congenital optic disc anomaly encountered in clinical practice. You can see how this condition was not recognized until until um, really close to the mid 1940s, because most cases were caused called optic atrophy, and you can see how many people would look at this and call it a normal optic disc with a central white cup, whereas really there's almost no optic disc. So what you see here is these tiny optic discs surrounded by the sort of dirty of RPE creating the double ring sign. And the double ring sign is really the disc in the middle and the RPE and sometimes the choroid coming in over the lamina cribrosa. So the, the outer margin is the normal lamina cribrosa, but then the RPE sort of creeps in centripetally and um, encroaches and sort of hugs the optic disc. Um, and so that's the double ring sign that that makes it look like a normal optic disc with a cup in the middle. And sometimes the the disc can be pink in the middle and sometimes it can be atrophic here. So you get optic atrophy coexisting with optic nerve hypoplasia in some cases. And generally it's thought that the later in gestation the in injury occurs, the more it tends toward toward optic atrophy, whereas earlier on, it would just be a small but pink optic disc in the middle. Um, one clue is this selective venous tortuosity that you see. That's really common with optic nerve hypoplasia, and it's thought that maybe the vessels are programmed normally, but, but there's less retina to perfuse, so you effectively get some shunting of blood into the veins. I'm not sure that I buy that, but that's the hypothesis. You can see the total absence of retinal nerve fiber layer, and there was no light perception in this patient, but vision can range from 2020 to no light perception. And as we'll see, it doesn't always correlate with the apparent size of the disc, except in extreme forms. You know, if it's very mild, it's usually normal. If it's very severe, it's usually severely affected. 
but um, so um, but but there are not, not all optic nerve hypoplasia looks that severe. That's sort of the four plus case. And but there are segmental forms of optic nerve hypoplasia. So you see here the superior segmental form of optic nerve hypoplasia that accompanies maternal diabetes. And they're actually, you know, if you were in the middle of a busy clinic, you would call this disc normal. But you see, um, you see um, relative pallor of the superior disc compared to the inferior disc. You see that the exit of the vessels is sort of kissing the superior um, margin of the disc. It's superiorly displaced. You see a superior double ring sign. And you can see a nice thick nerve fiber layer down here, and you don't see much of that up above. So that superior segmental optic hypoplasia, which is a teratogenic injury. So this is one of the forms that we understand. Diabe maternal diabetes causes several teratogenic injuries, but usually when you get this, it occurs by itself. It's in both optic nerves and you have these inferior visual field defects that look retinal in origin. The irony of this condition is it's caused by an endocrinologic disturbance, maternal diabetes, but the, these cases of optic nerve hypoplasia, these patients do not have associated endocrinologic deficiency, so you don't have to work them up for that. Well, um, in 1957, a, neuro, a Swiss neuropathologist named de Morsier um, described about 10 neuropathology specimens where he found small, he called them optic tracts, but he meant anterior visual pathways, absence of the corpus callosum, and a thin, I, I mean, absence of the septum pellucidum, and a thin corpus callosum. And here you can also see this sort of box carring of the lateral ventricles that's common when you don't have, um, when you have abnormal um, colossal development. Always get in the habit of looking on the coronal T1 weighted images because you can see the optic nerves in bold relief and you can diagnose the condition just from the scan without even looking at the nerves. As it turns out, absence of the septum pellucidum is the most conspicuous neuroimaging abnormality, but it's the most innocuous. Kids do fine with this if, if, if everything else is okay. So it's just the one that people picked up the earliest and it's the easiest to see. We all know that optic nerve hypoplasia is associated with um, hypopituitarism and we found it in about 25% of cases. Mark Borshert has cast a wide net and screened um, screened um, all of them for about 20 different hormones. And he finds it in the majority of cases because he's just looking for more things, I think. Um, but um, growth hormone deficiency is the most common, followed by growth hormone and thyrotropin deficiency, followed by those two plus corticotropin deficiency, followed by all three of those plus antidiuretic hormone um, deficiency. So this is sort of the pyramid of frequency of um, hormonal abnormalities. And the two things to ask about, the two questions I ask is, is there neonatal hypoglycemia, which signifies either low growth hormone or low steroid? Um, and is there neonatal jaundice, which signifies uh, low thyroid hor hormone? Um, so um, that's the most important history. You know, I really thought that 30 years out, we would understand the cause of most optic nerve hypoplasia, but we really have no idea that genetic studies have sort of fallen short in defining a cause. And so um, there are certain forms that are understood, which I'll touch upon, but, but we still don't really understand what, what causes this. And the only association that's really panned out is young maternal age. Um, so um, the most important thing in management is that 
everyone fixates on growth hormone deficiency, but it's the steroid deficiency, the corticotropin deficiency that's the killer. And, and th this plays out. So anyone with neonatal hypoglycemia or neonatal jaundice, you want to get them to an endocrinologist quickly. Um, this plays out um, where kids will get just a routine viral illness, no big deal, but they'll quit eating and they'll, um, and the, you know, they won't take in much fluids and then they'll just have a seizure, lose consciousness, deteriorate and die. And all of these kids have low corticotropin, but the trick is that you might measure it and it will be normal on the measurement. But, you know, if kids get sick or they have strabismus, they have surgery, they need four to times, four to six times the normal amount of corticotropin in order to deal with the stress. And they can't, they can't generate that response. So if a child gets a routine viral illness, they have a low steroid response. What do steroids do? They elevate your blood sugar, elevate your blood pressure. So they get hypotension, hypoglycemia. They're not drinking, so they're dehydrated. They may be throwing up and not even getting their meds. And so they get taken to the emergency room and they say, oh, well, this is um, must be sepsis. Let's give them antibiotics. But the thing is, you have to give these parents, these moms stress doses of corticosteroid to give them at the onset. I am and they can do it. They can be shown to do it easily with any any illness and then bring them straight to the ER so they can be well hydrated. So that's the big thing in management. Um, MR imaging fortunately shows this beautiful sign that just jumps out at you um, when they have the hormone deficiency. So here's the normal pituitary infant and you see bright white pituitary, posterior pituitary bright spot, anterior pituitary infant chiasm. In posterior pituitary ectopia, you get no posterior to pituitary bright spot no infundibulum, and this ectopic pituitary, posterior pituitary bright spot up there. That means they'll have anterior pituitary deficiency because this ectopic posterior pituitary gland is functioning normally. So let's say you see this, you see the same thing, but there's no posterior pituitary gland up here or down here. That means they won't have posterior pituitary dysfunction and they'll have ADH deficiency. So they'll get dehydrated really rapidly. And some have associated hypothalamic disturbances. So they'll have what's called poikilothermia where they're normal, they're, they'll have impaired temperature regulation. So their normal temperature might sit around 94, but then if they get a fever, it'll pulse up to 108. So all these things are very destabilizing. I've start, I used to get MR imaging first, but now I get it later because they have to sedate them for the MR imaging. And I'm always worried that that could kick them off into a, a clinical deterioration and if, if they're not covered with the steroids. Um, about a fourth of the kids have hemispheric abnormalities called schizencephaly, which is this abnormal gray matter lined cleft that extends from the cortical surface to the lateral ventricle and it's dysplastic gray matter. So, and these kids do terrible neurologically. They've got seizures, focal neurologic deficits, hemiplegia. So um, that's the hemispheric abnormalities are what determine the neurologic prognosis and the posterior pituitary ectopia is what determines the endocrinologic prognosis. And then the other thing is you see all these premature kids we see with retinopathy of prematurity, um, um, a lot of them have periventricular leukomalacia, which is these white matter lesions um, in the occipital, um, in the optic radiations at the occipital horns and also at the frontal horns. You know, the leg fibers hug the frontal horns most closely. And so these lesions cause 
paraplegia. So they come sort of clomping in, they're a little pigeon toed and, um, but they can have routine optic nerve hypoplasia and that's because of transsynaptic degeneration. So you get these lesions and if you get lesions after birth in your occipital cortex, you wouldn't get optic atrophy because it's retrogeniculate, it's postsynaptic. But if you get it in utero, you do get dying back of axons. But what's weird in this condition is often it manifests as pseudoglaucomatous cupping because the by the time it late of late gestation. The so you have one minute remaining. Sorry. Oh, okay. I I had I had said that I um, was going to need to go over by about five or ten minutes, and I don't need to do that unless you want me to. But otherwise, I could I could stop here. So just let me know. Um, you get these normal size scleral canals; they've already formed, and so instead of getting a double ring sign, you get coring out of the center of the nerve is sort of and so it's like a reverse double ring sign you get large round cups and you can see the superior neuroretinal rims a little thinner so they have inferior visual field defects so this is really common you see this and then some get routine optic nerve hypoplasia um would you like me to cover a few other entities or tell me what would be best Yes, doctor, go ahead. Yes, yes, please. And, and, and just tell me when to stop because I, um, I could go on for three hours. No, I'm just kidding. I got about 10 more minutes. Um, so this is a mystery to me, this condition. Um, we'll go from the tiny optic disc to the optic disc that ate New York. And this is the morning glory optic disc. And first of all it's huge it's about four to six times the normal optic disc area and it's this peripapillary retinal excavation and the disc is centered in the middle of it and then the central glial bouquet is centered in the middle of the optic disc so you've got these three concentric things huge disc and you have all cilia retinal vessels so it looks like the central retinal artery is involuted, and that's what's given rise to the central white glial tuft. When you see this, first thing you want to do is look at the face, because here's, um, here's a pretty girl who was Bill Hoyt's patient in San Francisco. Looks pretty normal, but if you look closely, there's this midline cleft in the upper lip. She has hypertelorism, widened by temporal diameter, and look at her depressed nasal bridge. So it's kind of a mid-facial defect. Things didn't fully come together. And this was actually her optic disc. Look, is this optic nerve hyper, 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 hypertrophy? Is there such a thing or hyperplasia? Because there's extra disc tissue. So, um, and you can see the peripapillary excavation. Whenever you see it, V-shaped or tongue-shaped excavation underneath the disc. You know, coloboma is wider inferiorly, but when it's narrower inferiorly, underneath a dysplastic disc, always look for transphenoidal encephalocele. Bill Hoyt used to say it's like an arrow pointing down saying, look in my pharynx. And when you look, you see this pouch um, this whole round hole in the sphenoid bone with this meningeal pouch extending down and the whole chiasm um, and hypothalamus is down in there too. So they used to try to go ahead and, um, and do surgery to um, push it back up, but that would produce terrible consequences. They also have absence of the septum pellucidum often and hormone problems because the whole hypothalamus is wedged down there. So the way these kids present is with nose breathing, snoring in a baby, nasal obstruction, and the ENT person looks in and sees polyps, nasal polyps, and they get ready to resect them. And they find that the polyps are pulsating and they say, wait a second, 
So what you want to do is leave these alone and just treat the hormone problems, and the kids do great unless they get operated on. Um, so they get transphenoidal encephalocele. The other thing they get is moya moya. In the same way that the central retinal artery involutes, the distal carotid can involute, not involute, be hypoplastic from the start. And they get these moya moya vessels. You know, people now treat moya moya vessels, moya moya syndrome in adults with bypass surgery. But these ones don't seem to progress. It seems to be a congenital thing. So they're at le less at risk for long-term neurological consequences. So I don't think you have to um, treat those. But so vasculopathy is definitely, vascular dysgenesis is definitely a component. And if you do color Doppler, you see no central retinal artery and only cilioretinal arteries. So if you look at this morning glory disc, if you think about it, like you're looking at the carotid artery from above, it's sort of a moya moya optic disc. You know, you have hypoplasia in the middle and then you have this puff of smoke of all these cilioretinal vessels sort of coming at you as an ophthalmologist. So it's sort of moya moya in the brain and moya moya in the eyes. So that's kind of a good way to, I call it the moya moya optic disc. Rarely kids can have, um, it can be associated with hemangiomas in, in the context of huge hemangiomas in girls in the context of facey syndrome, which is this condition where you get cerebellar malformations, vascular dysgenesis of the cranial vessels, cardiac abnormalities, and eye abnormalities, ma mainly the morning glory disc. And just to juxtapose that, we've seen pictures this morning of uh, optic disc coloboma. Morning glory disc used to be called the morning va glory variant of coloboma, but they're totally different things. One's an embryonic fissure defect. This one, the other one is a distal optic stock enlargement. So here, what you see is this white bowl-shaped excavation inferiorly decentered. And the disc looks huge, but really, if you look, the only disc substance is here. You see this sort of C-shaped or quarter moon-shaped superior optic disc. And um, so really, this is the most common form of segmental optic nerve hypoplasia. The only optic disc that's preserved is superiorly. And you can see other colobomatous defects of causing opacification of the lens and iris coloboma. And when you see this, you don't look for transphenoidal encephalocele. You look for multi-system disease like charge syndrome or Walker-Warburg syndrome where you have lysencephaly of the brain. So there are all these conditions associated with coloboma and, um, and a lot of them have skin lesions. A lot of them have cardiac lesions. Um, um, so, and, and a lot of them have, have brain abnormalities. So you want to look, look for multi-system disease in these kids. And the way you tell them apart, you know, with an optic disc coloboma, you have that C-shaped superior disc. Morning glory, you have an enlar enlarged round disc. Coloboma infrapapillary excavation. Um, morning glory disc peripapillary excavation. So if you're still in question, just remember in coloboma, the excavation looks like it's situated below the optic disc. In morning glory, the disc is situated centrally within the excavation. So it's really a um, everything sort of centripetally within everything else. I'll just mention two more and be done in, in three minutes. This is the vacant optic disc. Um, and what you see is you feel schizophrenic when you look at it. You say, well, it looks like a morning glory. No, 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 it looks like a coloboma. Well, it's not really inferiorly decentered. I know it has to be inferiorly decentered, but it's not really enlarged like a morning glory. There's no peripapillary stuff. And, um, 
and this is the vacant optic disc. It's all cilioretinal. There's no central retinal vasculature. But what's amazing is these kids have 20 20 vision. So you don't need a central retinal artery for 20 20 vision. And I've designated this the Parsa disc because Cameron Parsa described it. And and it's, a, it's what used to be called oculorenal coloboma syndrome, but it's not a coloboma. And I just sort of made this up, perturbed angiogenesis, renal complications, SANS, meaning missing the central retinal artery. And what you, um, what you see is it's autosomal dominant, no central retinal vasculature, sort of a vacant area in the middle, and you have to look for kidney problems. These kids get into kidney failure and they have hypertension. Um, so you check their blood pressure, BUN, creatinine, Doppler renal ultrasound, and some are associated with PAX2 mutation. So this is one of the optic disc anomalies that's known to be associated with a specific mutation. And the last one I'll just throw in for fun is ACARDI syndrome. And the neat thing about these abnormal discs is that they've got every malformation all thrown into one. You can see congenital optic disc pigmentation, a little optic pit thrown in there. Some of them have colobomas, some the disc is hypoplastic, but they have um, these peripapillary chorioretinal lacuna that nestle around the optic disc and get more sparse as you grow out. It's only in girls, and it's in girls with infantile spasms. So if you get referred to a patient with infantile spasms, there are hundreds of causes, but the two ophthalmic causes are acardi in girls and tuberous sclerosis can cause that. So you look for astrocytic hematoma and they have complete agenesis of the corpus callosum, unlike the optic nerve hypoplasias where it's just small. And they have all these intracranial cysts, they have pachygyria, polymicrogyria. And because they have no corpus callosum, if you do an EEG, you get hips arrhythmia where the two sides are going out of sync with each other. So there's no coordination. And it's only in girls that has a bad neurodevelopmental prognosis. And a few cases, of, it's thought to be X-linked um, lethal but a few cases have been described with mutations on chromosome three. Um, and so some have rib abnormalities, some have dysplastic facies, and the seizures are now treatable with vigabatrin and uh, lamotrigine. And so um, that's one that's just pathognomonic and they always show on the boards. And so you wanna know about that. So um, I better stop here before somebody hits the gong. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think you would have to stop sharing your screen. I think there's been a world of learning today. Anybody to ask any questions before I make my concluding remarks? Uh, Dr. Brodsky, I have a question. Uh, sometimes you see uh, children or adults with optic nerve hypoplasia and they have no history of neonatal hypoglycemia or frequent hospitalizations or neonatal jaundice. Would you still recommend neuroimaging in these uh, patients who have uh, uh, this optic nerve hypoplasia? Uh, is that recommended? That's a tough call. When I don't... For, if you have unilateral optic nerve hypoplasia, you can still get all the endocrine problems, but it's just less common. So just because it's unilateral doesn't mean you shouldn't get it. Um, when they don't have it, um, Mark Borchert's group has found that a lot of them have some subtle things and that you probably should go ahead and get it in everyone. I used to predicate it on the MR. I would get MR imaging and then if they didn't have posterior pituitary ectopia, I wouldn't get it. But now I do tend to get it in everyone because, you know, there's a lot of subliminal stuff going on. And so, um, so yeah, I do, I do go ahead and get it now. Now, when I don't get it is when they're five years old or eight years old and you already know kind of how they've turned out, you know, because 
if they're doing fine at that stage, you know, you probably, you know, don't need to get it, you know, but, but it's an infancy when you want to, where you can redirect things and replace hormones that it's, that it's more helpful, you know. Okay. Uh, you had brought up this issue of Vigabacterin uh, in infantile spasms. So um, how do you screen for Vigabacterin toxicity in uh, these children who are put on Vigabacterin? I mean, are there any recommendations of uh, what to do, ERG or fields? Or... It's always been a futile endeavor. We in, in, in Canada, you don't have to screen that often. In America, they made a screen every four months. And you'd never really see any definite changes. And they were too young to get OCT. And um, and then once, you know, you look for nasal pallor of the optic disc with Vigabatrin. But the trouble is, especially in kids like with Acardi, even when you think you find some change and you let the neurologist know, often they have poor vision, so they're not visually dependent anyway. And the drug is just a miracle drug for the seizure. So even if you knew for a fact it was causing damage, the parents and the neurologist would not want to stop the medications. So it sort of um, it was sort of this epidemic of screening, but it never really led anywhere, you know, because you would it wouldn't be actionable because because the drug is so powerful for the seizures. Thank you so much, Dr. Mike. That was a wonderful 20-odd minutes of uh, learning for all of us. So I think uh, time's up, so we need to conclude. So uh, needless to say, this webinar has been true learning for all of us, and it's happened because of the terrific speakers, their contributions, all of you, each and every one of you here. Um, immense thanks to you for having made it a most wonderful webinar, and Thanks a lot to Dr. Murli also for his enormous commitment to ensure that all of it does happen along with me. And my thanks are due to my very capable ARC team who are always there with me. Rohit is here at this point of time. And, uh, and of course, uh, my thanks are due to the AIS admin uh, headed by Kripal uh, and his team. My thanks to Sai and Manjula from Numerotech. My very special thanks to this uh, sponsorship of this webinar was done by Sun Pharma and they plan to be sponsoring all our PG uh, update webinars throughout this year. And finally, and most importantly, I think we owe our thanks, plenty of thanks to our attendees who make us keep coming back to asking each of you all to talk and make it a memorable uh, webinar for all of them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Mike. Thanks a lot for your wonderful talk, and all of us gained a lot from you. Thank you so much for being with us all through oh, the webinar. I learned so much too, and I'm so grateful to. I wouldn't have known about this. I'm so grateful to have been a part of it, and so um, keep me in the loop, please. Yes. 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 Sure. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, ask Joy T to come visit me again. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yes. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.